Well, welcome to a very special edition of uh, Manzello's fourth page. Uh, if any, everybody was watching TV uh, Wednesday night, uh, ESPN, you saw one of the great shows put on by a Holy Cross basketball team. And the guy in charge of that Holy Cross team, the mixed master of that team, George Blaney, is with us today as our special guest. George, Hi, Nick. nice to have you here. Thank you. Stick around. We'll be back in a minute. Well, welcome back. Uh, hey, Judge, Holy Cross 98, Bucknell 73, one of the great games that I saw this year on ESPN. And I guess that a lot of people must be calling you because uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know how close I am to Holy Cross. That was probably one of the best two-way games I've, I've seen the Crusaders play in years. Well, it was a fine game, Nick. Uh, I think the, 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 the thing that I liked about it was that we played uh, both offense and defense and executed both in both areas exceptionally well. Uh, I think offensively, we scored 98 points and only did not have one guy score more than 17 points. So that's kind of interesting. And de defensively, we held them to 39 shooting, 39 percent shooting percentage and uh, really got after them and played good defense and out-rebounded them by 20. So. Um, I, I can't say enough for the way they played the game. We went into a hostile environment. We went in a game that we had to win. Uh, we knew what the rewards were for winning. We knew what uh, the penalty was for losing. So um, under those conditions, uh, I think the kids really responded exceptionally well and, and just did a terrific job. Oh, what a place to showcase that talent, though, on ESPN nationwide. Well, uh, this has got to help your recruiting. I, uh, I just yeah, and, and this I time, believe. this time of year, as you as you know, everyone's watching those games. They love the conference uh, championship games and the, the the games that lead to the NCAA. So uh, you know you're getting a good audience, and uh, ESPN does a does a real good job of marketing it. And so yeah, it's it's a it's a real plus. All right, now, last time you went there, it was 1980. Michigan was was the seeded number one. You guys went out there, and I can never remember Brent Mus Musburger and a few of those guys hmm. talking about what a, what a patsy that Michigan got. Now, you go out there, you play Michigan right down the, the wire. I mean, without your star, Ronnie Perry. Yeah. Now, how do you compare this team with that 1980 team? Well, I, I'm not good at comparing teams, and I, I think I leave that up to other people to do that. I, I, that was a great basketball team that we had, uh, Potter and Vicenz, and John O'Connor and uh, uh, Ronnie Perry, and Ronnie didn't play in the game, so uh, but it was an exceptional team, a, a team that uh, w was a top 20 team at different times during that, t that year, so uh, um, this is a good team. This is a real good basketball team. This is a team that plays together. They, they understand what, what it takes to, uh, uh, to win, what it takes to, to live together, what it takes to win together, what it takes to lose together. Um, it's a veteran team with a sprinkling of good young players throughout the team, so uh, I like this team a lot, uh, but uh, someone else is going to have to compare them. Okay, now I'll tell you, uh, no doubt the phone's been ringing, mm -hmm. and no doubt people want to know, Judge, where do you think you'll be going? Where do you think you'll be seated? Who do you think you'll be playing? I know, I know what you like, talking to you and I guess the kids. Uh, well, Orlando well, would be great at this time of year. Yeah, I, th I think you know everyone in New England's had enough snow uh, for for a couple of years, so we, we'd all like to go to Tucson, Arizona, or Orlando, Florida, or someplace like that. Uh, I think the NCAA tournament committee generally likes to keep you somewhere near home in the first round if they can. I think if you look at the history of the tournament over the last couple of years, <clears throat> probably 50 percent of the teams in the first round will stay close to home. So I think it's a 50-50 chance that we would go to Syracuse. Uh, and if not Syracuse, the next next one probably would be Nashville or Winston-Salem. Uh, but, I mean, we could be any place. And uh, so, you know, again, we're c coming back on the bus last night, the kids were all uh, chanting Orlando or, or Tucson, and I think that's where they all want to go. Ah, the one was. Listen, Judge, uh, though in the state of Massachusetts, we could see we could, could have three teams in the NCAA, in B.C., Holy Cross, and U.S. Yeah, and, 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 and really, Northeastern had had a terrific year, yeah. and, uh, you know, it looked like they might have had a chance at their tournament, but uh, they won't be going now. And, and BC has to do something in the tournament. They, they're going to have to win 
probably two games in a tournament to get in, but they've had a fine year and uh, just have really slid a little bit recently. And uh, um, but I think they're a team that's capable if they can get by two games. If they can win two games in the in the Big East tournament, uh, they would be in. I would think. Well, there's three other New England teams: uh, Rhode Island, Providence, and UConn. Uh, I think well, Providence, those teams are probably being Providence is in the same position. They probably only have to win one game maybe in the tournament. If they can beat Connecticut, uh, they probably get in. Uh, Rhode, Island, Rhode Island is still a bubble team, and yet I think uh, the Atlantic 10 has got such a high power rating this year that uh, they might get four teams and maybe even five, but I think four teams could go from the Atlantic 10, and, and if so, Rhode Island should go. Now, uh, a, a story uh, appeared in the uh, Boston Globe couple of weeks ago, where one of the top basketball writers came up to Holy Cross and he talked about the academics of, uh, of, of these kids. And it was amazing to see the comparison. And I understand that uh, Providence picked up the, had a story on it, and maybe Connecticut someplace, but uh, this, well, Martin, this, this doesn't phase you at all because this is the way it's been. I think the story was was written by Mark Barsham. He did a great job. He came up. He did his homework. He uh, he interviewed everybody. Uh, he talked about uh, academics at Holy Cross. He talked about uh, the Patriot League. He talked about different aspects uh, of of athletics uh, at Holy Cross, uh, and he and he, uh, he pre pre presented it uh, very well. Uh, uh, but academics haven't changed in all the years that uh, that, yeah. you, that you and I know Holy sure. Cross. They were, they were the same when I was there. They were the same when I when I first started coaching. Uh, uh, we we attract a certain uh, kind of athlete, a certain kind of student. Uh, it, it is a very difficult school to get into. It's a very highly academic school. It's a highly uh, a high, highly rated school. It has a great reputation throughout the country, throughout um, graduate schools, throughout uh, businesses that hire people. Uh, so you, you, you are eliminating an awful lot of people right from the very beginning, uh, people that, that just do not have the grades to get into the school. So uh, recruiting from uh, for Holy Cross in athletics, you start with that premise, and uh, we've never altered from that. So it's no different now than it was when, when I was playing or when I was first started coaching. Yeah, now I know that over the years uh, you can probably write a book on the, on the basketball players that you couldn't get into Holy Cross, you went out to other schools and made it all America. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, that's that's like that's, 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 that's like wasting your time talking about things that can't happen. You you, you yeah. worry about things you control, and you don't you don't you don't consider those things. I, and I, I always like Al McGuire's uh, uh, theory on that is. Uh, coaches have a, tend to have a tendency to, when they don't recruit a player, when they don't get the player that they're recruiting, that someone else stole them, somebody else cheated to get them, and uh, yeah. you know, a lot of times you just lose the kid. Uh, some, somebody else out recruits you sometimes, and uh, uh, or so, or the kid just wants to go to a different school, and you only you really only recruit two, three, four players a year, so you're going to miss a lot of players. You're going to miss yeah. a lot of them because you made a mistake. You're going to miss a lot of them because. Uh, the, the kid didn't want to come to your school. You're going to miss a lot of them because of academics. So uh, you don't worry about those those that you that, that you miss. Okay, listen. Speaking about missing, Judge, we got to pay some bills. Stick around. Mm -hmm. We'll be back in a minute. Well, welcome back. Uh, George, what about the top conferences in the country? Uh, I was watching uh, TV uh, late one night, and they start talking about it. I was amazed how they went to, like, the Big Ten, ACC, uh, down the Southwest and so forth, mm -hmm. and uh, Big Eight. And uh, they had the Big East ranked seventh. Now, is there... Is the the Big East the three think, years that much? Of I think the place? general the general perception is that the Big East has dropped a little bit. But I, I think if you're in the top seven, eight, nine, ten conferences in the country, you're still amongst the elite. And uh, to to say that the Big East is uh, is seventh and the Atlantic Ten might be fourth or fifth, uh, it's it's so close. I don't know that it matters. Uh, uh, the Big East is a powerful uh, conference. Uh, it, it's a it, it's got caught a little bit by parity this year. 
Um, and it's, it, there's probably only one elite team in the Big East, and that's Seton Hall right at this stage. So you know, they've suffered a little bit, but they've more suffered from the comparison to what they've been. And uh, I, I don't know. that I, I think you're seeing more and more parity in, in college basketball as, as the scholarships dwindle uh, at each school uh, where, you know, it, it used to be back when UCLA was winning all those, those things, uh, teams had 20 scholarships. Uh, then they started reducing it back to 18, then they reduced it to 15. Uh, now we're back to 14, and next year we'll be back to 13. So uh, that all that does is it spreads the talent even more. So you're going to see more and more teams are going to be a little bit better, and you're going to see less teams uh, be dominant. And uh, every conference is going to have five or six good basketball teams in it, not not just one or two. But you know, certainly the Big Ten is having a phenomenal year. You have uh, any number, five, six, seven teams could make the tournament from the from the Big Ten, and the ACC is an exceptionally strong uh, league this year. Uh, but the Big East will be, be there, they're, 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 um, uh, uh, and they'll be back. They, they have good young players in the league, and they'll certainly recruit good players. Well, uh, I think the surprise league probably has been the Atlantic Ten. Atlantic Ten. I, I think, I think the Atlantic Ten has done a great job of ignoring, I think they spent the, their early formative years of, of worrying about the Big East, and they tried to compare themselves and do all that. And they finally found their own niche and, uh, and stopped worrying about the Big East and just started playing and recruiting uh, the kind of players that they could, could get. And, uh, you know, Temple, West Virginia, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, uh, uh, you know, they've just done a great, great job. St. Joseph's, uh, you know, and they're, they're, West they're, Virginia, yeah. they're, they're a powerful league right now. And, I mean, they, they deserve to be rated fourth, fifth, wherever it is that they are rated. All right, now, uh, early on this season, I'm watching the TV program, and they're talking about the Big East. And what they do is they line these teams up. And they talked about, let's put it, let's, let's face it, some of the patchy teams that are being played. They particularly talked about Georgetown. They went out there and got eight or nine victories right off the bat. Some of the teams, I'll be honest with George, there's a couple I never heard of. But that's neither here nor there. Toward the end, they said, this might have hurt them. Now, if you take the Big Ten, I can remember them opening up. I, I think, what, Indiana? Mm. Go right out and play Purdue yeah. or somebody, and then came back and played Michigan? Well, I think different coaches have different philosophies on how they want to prepare their team to get ready for either conference play or postseason play. You know, some, some want to bring them along slowly. Particularly if you have a young team, you might want to bring them along slowly, and you might schedule that year a little bit. Uh, less of a schedule, but the Denny Crumbs and the Bobby Knights and the Mike Shashevskys and and those kind of guys, they they want to they want to play the best people all the time. Uh, Crum has for years played as tough a schedule as there is in 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 the country, and and he always feels that three, four, five, six losses sometimes during a non-conference part of your schedule is not going to hurt you. And I think he's right. Uh, you know, we we've kind of copied that ourselves. We like to play a tough non-conference schedule yeah. so that. Uh, that we get ready, and uh, you know that you know even though it might cost you some games uh, in December, uh, it seems to get you ready for conference play and then for postseason play. Uh, but th there are different philosophies, and I, and I think you have to go with a school philosophy and decide what is best for you. And, and uh, but it does cause controversy, and it does cause uh, whether or not a team should be selected if they've played Division Two squads or you know that kind of thing. The, the thing that the, the strong conferences have built in is that when you play in conference, you're going to play four or five teams that are in top 20. So your, your power rating is going to remain strong no matter what you do outside the conference. So, uh, but I think, uh, uh, I think recently more and more teams are, are going out and playing each other. You know, you're seeing uh, Indiana play Kentucky, and you're seeing Louisville play uh, you know, UCLA and, and those kinds of games, big marquee games. And uh, people want it, television want it, and, uh, and, the, and the teams want it. So you're, you're getting more of it these days. All right, well, now you're speaking like an ambassador. What, you're the president of the what, National Coaches I, Association? What I, is that? I'll be president in April of the National Association of Basketball Coaches, which uh, involves all the basketball coaches uh, in Division One, Two, II, and Three, and uh, high school coaches and junior college coaches. And so it's, uh, you're, 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 I've been on a board, uh, a board of directors uh, of the association for about 10 years, and you keep moving up the ladder as you go along. And so it'll be my turn to be president. Uh, uh, starting in April, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. it. It'll be a great challenge. We've changed the NABC, the, the, the association, uh, a great deal, and we're trying to, to take it from a, a relatively conservative organization to a proactive organization. And uh, Johnny Orr, who's the president this year from Iowa State, has done a great job of, 
of implementing a lot of new things, and, uh, and we're trying to go forward with that and trying to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. I think the coaches are, are very sensitive to that. And, uh, you know, we, we, there have been a lot of abuses in college athletics. There have been a lot of abuses by, co by yeah. coaches, and uh, we'd like to be the solution rather than the problem. What about the, what about the West Coast coach? Was Campanelli, whatever his name was, uh, getting well, fired like that? that yeah, we're, we're, the thing that we're upset about in, in the firing of Lou Campanelli at the University of California, one of the great institutions in America, uh, by the way, is that uh, he was fired in, in midseason, uh, very much like a pro coach. Uh, he was fired uh, really without being told what the problem was. Uh, he was fired uh, by an athletic director who stood outside his locker room, didn't, did not come into his locker room, did not ask to come into the locker room and listen to his, his uh, conversation after a couple of losses and, and fired him uh, for that uh, rather than coming in and saying, Lou, we have a problem, we don't want you to act this way and let's, let's deal with the problem. So. Uh, due process really was was what we're concerned about, and uh, you know, we're not saying that coaches shouldn't be fired. We certainly understand that, and uh, it's a highly competitive game and uh, an emotional game. Uh, what we're upset about, and uh, we, we don't, uh, you know, you'd like to to be fired for uh, good reasons, uh, not by ad, uh, fan administrators, uh, which which you have in a lot of places. Okay, listen, stick around. When we return. The coach and I will be talking a little bit about the final four. Hey, maybe we'll give you a couple of picks. Hang on. Well, welcome back, Coach. We're going to close this segment out. So, first of all, let's uh, let's uh, let's stick it in there, all right? <laughs> if you were to pick the top team in the country right now, well, I, I, I'm from on, a better standpoint. No, we're not talking about betting. I, I'm on the board that we we pick the top 25 every week, and uh, uh, I voted North Carolina number one this week, and in Indiana. Um, I, I still think if Grant Hill gets back at Duke, Duke has a chance to get to the Final Four again. But there's probably seven or eight teams that, that can win the whole thing. Michigan certainly has the ability to, to win it. Kansas probably has the ability to win it. Uh, Kentucky uh, certainly uh, can get on a roll, particularly with their ability to shoot the three and to, to defend full court. Um, there's a, Cincinnati plays good enough defense to win it. Uh, those kinds of teams are the teams that you would look for uh, coming in. Indiana is, is is uh, playing very well. If they get Henderson back, uh, he played a, he played a couple of seconds last night in last night's game. If if he gets back, uh, they could be a real. What about threat. Seton Hall? Are they get a shot? Uh, I think Seton Hall is a you know Seton Hall has all the answers. Seton Hall is terrific backcourt. They have size. Uh, they have great defense. They have uh, veterans and young guys. They have a, a go-to guy in De Hair. Uh, certainly, they're a team that uh, is very capable and. Um, you know, but the team probably playing the best right now is North Carolina. So, uh, uh, but you're, you're looking, uh, you're looking a ways away yet about who's going to get hot in the tournament. And uh, it seems that that's what you have to do. You have to get hot. You have to stay away from injuries. You have to get uh, uh, games that are officiated to your style of game. So uh, it, it, it takes a lot to uh, to win six games in that tournament. But well, North Carolina, I, I watched that kid Montrose three or four times. It's going to take a real good team and a real good ball player to, to slow that kid down. It's just amazing. No question. I mean, he works inside the paint as good as any big guy you've yeah, seen around. Yeah, they're, they're physically imposing, and, and that's what's going to – they and Michigan uh, probably are the two most physically imposing teams uh, that, that, that you want, you'd want to play in, the, in that tournament. So both of those teams uh, go in with, with great, great athletes with, with, with size and speed and quickness. And, uh, and that, that, that really is tough to compensate against. But, you know, Duke has been there so many times, and uh, if they get healthy, they certainly uh, could be a team that could, could get there. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, Indiana or Kentucky or uh, any of those teams. Arizona. Well, I'll tell you, I, uh, I feel, this is my own prediction, uh, I like North Carolina. I like North Carolina before I start talking. I even like them more uh, after talking. Okay, what about... Uh, do you think we're ever going to see a New England tournament again? Uh, I don't know. We're, we're, ne we're negotiating right now with uh, Massachusetts to play them in the Centrum next year. Uh, it would be a great game, uh, I think. 
I don't know about a New England tournament, whether or not that's going to happen. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to start tournaments these days. We we're all playing one less game than we used to. We used to play 27, now we're playing 26. So uh, to commit to a tournament, you have to commit two games, and that's very difficult to do. And uh, uh, tournaments are lined up years out in advance. We're going to the Cable Car Classic next year out in San Francisco. But uh, it's an idea. It's an idea that could happen. Uh, I think Massachusetts' willingness to to play any place, any time uh, is really uh, terrific of John Calipari and, and his program. And, uh, and I think that if it has a chance, uh, it would be because of his willingness to do something like that. But uh, it would be great to have uh, UMass and, and the Holy Cross in the Central. John told me that uh, when they were here for the NCAAs, he couldn't believe the people of Worcester. And he says, I know there's a lot of Holy Cross fans, he says, and the way they all rooted for us. Well, I still he think says, the greatest statement I heard was uh, Tom Butters, who is the chairman of the yeah, NCAA right. Tournament Committee, the Duke Athletic Director, and he ran the tournament when, uh, when the tournament was here uh, uh, at last, uh, last spring. And uh, uh, his, uh, the, the Friday game, the, the Friday afternoon game, which is a game where, wherever it's played throughout the country, uh, you know, they usually they sell all the tickets, but nobody shows up for that game. People are still working and, and, uh, and that type of thing. But uh, 15,000 people showed up here at Worcester. They, uh, there wasn't a seat that was unoccupied in, in the game. And, and Butter's statement after the game was, uh, uh, Worcester must have 15,000 coaches. Uh, so I think, it's a, I think the, it's a basketball town. It's a, it's a town that has always responded to great basketball and, uh, and loves great basketball and knows great basketball. So. Uh, when Calipari brings a good team here, he's going to get uh, he's going to get uh, that kind of reception. Uh, they played terrific basketball. They were they were a Cinderella team that uh, that won 30 games and and played with great enthusiasm and excitement and uh, and really captured a lot of people. Well, what about Holy Cross today? How was Holy Cross? Was it <laughs> how was it setting up at Holy Cross today? Was everybody in a real good mood? And Oh, well, you know, we got in at 5.30 this morning uh, from a long bus trip. Uh, we, we said it was the shortest six hours we ever, ever took, I guess, but because uh, everybody was so happy. And uh, about 150 students met us uh, at 5.15, 5.30 in the morning, which was really great. Uh, and, uh, you know, Channel 5 and 4 and all the stations were up today talking to the kids. And uh, so it's, it's kind of a nice, uh, nice situation right now. But uh, we'll get back to reality Saturday when we start practicing again. Okay, what about, what about uh, quickly uh, recruiting? You've got a, a couple of good uh, got, kids in there, especially Terry Driscoll's kid. Yeah, Terry Driscoll uh, was a great player at Boston College and then in the pros. His, his son from BC High, Keith Driscoll, is a 6'7", maybe going to be 6'8", player, a very strong young man, and uh, I think is going to be a terrific college basketball player. We've got the leading scorer in the state, Chris Rojek uh, from Sacred Heart in Kingston, a 6'6", player that has uh, terrific ball skills, uh, passing and shooting ability. And we got a really nice player from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, of all places, uh, Pat Patrick Tutwiler. Uh, he's about 6'6", six, six, a very athletic kid, a good inside player. So uh, all three of those players have agreed to come to Holy Cross at this stage. And we're, we're looking to bring one or two more in as we, we'll lose five this year. The five seniors will go this year. So we'd like to bring in four or five this year. But listen, Josh, thanks an awful lot. I know you're Thank very you, busy. Man. I know you got a couple of appointments. Hey, listen, thanks a lot for tuning in. And remember, you better go with the Crusaders. See you next week.